Thank you so much for joining us online today. We so appreciate you checking out this message. Uh, we hope you enjoy it and are inspired to live more and more like Jesus Christ by His grace. If you would like to support the ministries of Rancho, you can do so at rancho.tv slash giving. Set up a giving profile and a reoccurring gift. We'd sure appreciate that. Enjoy. Today, I invited some friends to come up and join me at the beginning because... We are in week four of our series we're calling Revamps, where we're just looking at some areas of our life where maybe we wanna make some small changes that have a big impact. And today we're talking about friendships. And Alex and Stephanie, I got to meet the two of you in fall of 2021. It was fantastic, you were new to Rancho. And one of the first questions that they had for me was, Carissa, how do we join a group? And I was, surprised and we also great. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, they know what they're doing around here. And so we got to talking, they got involved in a group and have made some incredible friendships. And so I just wanted to hear a little bit of their story today. So why was like your number one, maybe number one priority when you got here? For sure. Join a group? Yeah. Tell yeah. Us why. No, it, it definitely was. And, and so the reason why is we're a military family. And so, you know, part of the the thing that makes that super fun is getting to move every two to three years for the last 20 years. So every time we do, uh, we have to find a new church, right? And so we have stood in that doorway and, and many like it on our very first time at a new church, not knowing anybody. Mm -hmm. And we've learned from that um, and, and participating in many groups that groups are the way uh, to make a big church feel small yeah. and to make, you know, um, to make friends and to make, you know, something that can seem scary and unfamiliar mm -hmm. start to feel like family and, and home really yeah. quick. So Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. And you heard it from him, not from me, not from Scott, not from Steve. It's fantastic. You did not pay me. <laughs> I love it. Stephanie, what about you? It's been a big priority for you as well. It has. Every time we move, we're in a different season of life. So it's always been a priority to find people who are in that season of life with us. And groups are just such a great way to find an eclectic group of people, but in the hopes of finding long lasting friendships, especially because with us moving, it's hard to find people who want to dive in with you when they know you're going to leave. But it is through groups that we have found those solid friendships and have been able to develop them and grow them. And I mean, it doesn't come without risk, as Chris has mentioned, and you'll hear a little later, but it is definitely worth the risk. And I For have sure. personally found, and I think Alex would say the same, that through putting ourselves out there and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, we have been paid back tenfold by the friendships that we've made. Yep. And we're yeah. in a group together, and I'm also in a mom for teens group, and we just, we've made great connections. Yep. I love that. So we have some very experienced risk takers here. <laughs> Alex, you and I are not as experienced with this. You know, once you've been around church for a while, you kind of find your people and you latch onto them, and you don't always have to put yourself out again and risk again. And so can you remember when you took that risk and jumped in? What was that like? I am not a super groups person. So I, I, it's hard for me to remember last time I joined a new group. Like if you ask me to do that, I can do that all day long. But to get into a small room with people I don't know, yep. um, it makes me anxious even talking about it. So I understand that. But <laughs> I do know that at some point in my life, I did take that risk. And I have some lifelong friends, like you said, who have been there with me and my wife through thick and thin, through things that we could, or not, we could not have made it through without their support and without them actually kind of living out the hands and feet of Jesus to us. So I would say, take the risk. It's scary, but take it because yeah. it will pay off in dividends. Absolutely. So I have some fresh experience with this that I was not expecting. Our racial reconciliation team invited some of us to take a virtual course with them called Racial Literacy 101. And I was thinking, this is awesome. I'm going to get to learn about a really important topic with some of my friends from Rancho. And we joined, and the first night, they put me in a group with five strangers who live in other parts of the country. And we're talking about important and sensitive and timely topics and it feels vulnerable. And I've had moments when I think, oh, I feel, I feel, I feel all that in my gut right now. And at the same time, it's been a reminder to me of some of what we ask you to do. And so last question, Alex, 
it's a little different finding and making friends as a guy than it is as a girl. How have groups helped you with that? Yeah, it, it's totally different. Um, I, I mean, our experience has been the, the same, right? Like, we, we came to Rancho a little over a year ago. We joined a group we knew no one. We joined the Conversations with Steve group, which we're now doing again for the third time together. Yeah. Um, literally knew no one. Not Steve, not anyone else. Mm -hmm. and, and through that time, just being in community, right? Yeah. The people who are strangers on day one, mm -hmm. They grow into to familiar faces. And then out of that come friendships. Mm -hmm. And out of that comes the people that you see on a Wednesday night or the people now that you see yeah. on Sunday. And, um, and then outside of that too. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard as a guy, right? Um, it, it is totally hard to start and cultivate new friendships. But being in a group, I feel like, has been a huge way mm -hmm. to make that more possible. Yeah. yeah, and worth it. And totally worth it. It's good stuff. Well, thank you so much for sharing Thanks. your story. Would you say thank you to them for me this morning? Love that. It's good stuff. Some of you might be able to relate to them as well. If you are new to the area, I think every weekend I'm meeting uh, those of you who are new, not just to Rancho, but new to the area and maybe starting over. But before we talk about friendship, I want to talk to you about sports. All right, I have a couple people who gave me like, yeah, let's talk about that. Um, I'm not sure you can totally trust me on this topic, but I'm gonna do my best. Okay, so who are my athletes in the room? It doesn't matter if it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, it counts. Who are my athletes online? I want you to jump in that chat box and let us know. All right, so we have some athletes in the room, we have some athletes online. Now I need you to tell me who you really are. Are you team sports or are you solo sports? All right, how many of you are team sport players? Yep, basketball, softball, volleyball. Where are my solo sport athletes? Yes, okay, golf, gymnastics. Yeah, those kinds of, those kinds of sports. Some of you are questioning whether or not golf is actually a sport. It's yet to be determined. I wanna share an opinion with you today that you may not like but I think I'm right. So just go with me on it, okay? What if I told you there are actually not any solo sports? None. Nothing counts as a legitimate solo sport. I mean, think about it. Tiger Woods cannot actually play golf if no one's carrying the clubs. I mean, really, can he? Uh, okay, boxing, let's think about boxing. Is Mike Tyson? Can he even box if there's not someone to wipe his brow and squirt water in his mouth? Do I have NASCAR fans in the room? Okay, no one else is gonna drive the car, but can you help me out? Who's a famous NASCAR racer? I forgot my name that I had, who's the famous one? Earnhardt, yeah. Okay, he can't change his own tires, right? He needs a pit crew. Now, I was thinking this week, if there was ever going to be a legitimate solo sport, it would be long distance open water swimming. I mean, think about it. All you need is a swimsuit and some goggles and the ocean. What else could you possibly need? And then I read a story about an incredible athlete named Diana Niad. Now, Diana, was the first person to complete a swim from Cuba to Florida. Let that sink in for a second. She swam in the ocean from Cuba to Florida without a shark cage. This is shark infested waters. She had already done some long distance open water swimming earlier in her life in a shark cage. I didn't even know they made shark cages for this, but they do. This time she decided, and we'll leave it up to you to decide whether it was a smart decision or not, that she did not want to do it with a shark cage. 110 miles in shark-infested water. She was 64 years old when she did this, friends. Can we talk about how incredible that is? 64 years old. It took her 52 hours, 54 minutes, 18.6 seconds. I have a picture of her that you're gonna get to see, if there was ever going to be a solo sport athlete, it would be Diana, right? 
except she swam 110 miles in shark-infested water at 64 years old in 52 hours, 54 minutes, 18.6 seconds with the help of a 35-person support team. Now, I couldn't find a picture with all 35 people. That was the best I could find. But she needed a boat. She needed someone to captain that boat. She needed an experienced navigator to get them on the correct path and keep them on the correct path. She needed a medic because evidently it's not great for your body when you swim and you don't sleep for 54 hours. Some things can go wrong. She needed people to watch out for the sharks because she decided to do this without a shark cage. She even needed some people who would call out to her every 90 minutes and she'd swim over to the boat and they would drop food in her mouth because when you are this kind of athlete, no one is supposed to touch you. But you can't swim for 54 hours straight without getting some food and some nourishment in your body. I mean, think about it, friends. There are no actual solo sports. We were not created to fly solo. I mean, think about it. Life is a little bit like a long distance open water swim. Sometimes you're swimming and it's calm and beautiful and you look over and there's a pod of dolphins and you're excited and you're filled with joy and a sense of wonder and awe. And then sometimes before you know it, a storm rolls in and the waves are crashing and you're swallowing water, and then you look over and there's the wrong kind of fin, and you're wishing you had a shark cage, but you're really grateful that you have a support team who's there to help you get from point A to point B. So here's the thing, making friends is hard. Do you know what's harder than making friends in middle school? Think back to middle school. Think back to how much awkward and uncertain middle school was. What's harder than making friends in middle school? Making friends now. Did you ever imagine in middle school that you were gonna grow up to be an adult one day and think, man, making friends as an adult is even harder than it was to make friends in middle school? It's not easy. We move, we lose touch, And we decide sometimes it's too exhausting to start over. I've talked with many of you who've said to me, Carissa, I want friends and I want community, but man, I feel like I'm on my third cycle of friendships and I just don't know if I have it in me to start over again. We've been hurt, rejected, betrayed, let down because we're in relationship, in friendships with human beings who make mistakes and are flawed. And so we just decide we're gonna kind of keep it cash we're just going to kind of have a distance. We're going to have a little shark cage around us, but it's not to keep the sharks away. It's to keep the people at a safe distance. I think some of you might be able to relate to that today. We're focused on all the other things, many of which are super important. Work, parenting, marriage, uh, caring for aging parents, caring for grandkids, all that stuff. And before we realize it, we think, I don't know if I actually have time to build friendships, to invest in friendships. It's just not a priority in my life right now, Carissa. We put ourselves out there, it doesn't go well. So we just keep a safe distance. And I get it, friends, I can relate to all of those in different seasons of my life when I've had to start over or I've had to you know, cultivate new friendships or different friendships for all kinds of different reasons. Those have been some of the things that I've been tempted to lean into and to stick with. What I want us to consider today is that we are created and designed to enjoy friendship. It's not just a bonus. It's just not something that some of the lucky people get to have. It's not something that I really even think is optional in this life that God has given to us. I think we're created to enjoy it. Now, whether you're new to the area and you're starting over or you feel a little disconnected in a sea of surface level friendships or you've been hurt and betrayed before and you're not sure you wanna risk starting over, what I want you to know today is I think there's gonna be something that you'll be able to walk out of here with that will help you to revamp friendship in your life. For some of you, it's that you need to start totally fresh. 
You need to build some new friendships today. For others of you, you have some friends, but maybe you want some deeper connection. You really would love to feel seen and valued and known for who you are, but you're not sure how to develop that. For others of you, you may have some great community and some great friends around you. We're gonna talk about some things together today that will help you to continue to invest and maintain some solid, healthy, life-giving friendships in your life. We're gonna talk about two truths to build our friendships on today, and then we're gonna talk about some really practical ways to live that out that we see modeled in the life of Jesus. So, what we believe about friendship makes the biggest difference in our ability to make a change. What we believe about friendship is where we have to start. Before we get to the practical, before we talk about how to make friends and how to keep friends and how to invest in friends, we gotta talk about what we believe about ourselves, what we believe about friendship, what we believe about other people. So we're gonna go back to Genesis chapter one. We're in verse 26 and verse 31. This is our foundational truth we build on. God spoke and he said, let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature. God looked at everything he had made. It was good. It was very good. And so as we consider what it looks like to revamp our friendships, we want to start with the foundational truth that you are good. That you are created in the image and the likeness of God. And I know you've heard us tell you this before. You've heard Scott preach this recently. I don't think we can hear this enough. Our identity is based off of the reality that we are created in the image and likeness of God. And so God says, we are good. That is the deepest, truest part of us. And I share this with you, this reminder this morning, because often I've had the privilege of sitting with people and they'll say to me, Carissa, I don't know if I deserve to have the kind of relationships you're talking about, the kind of community that you're talking about. I've made mistakes, I've messed up. People have told me they don't want me to be included in something or I have felt like I shouldn't be there or I, I just don't feel like I fit or like I belong. And so we have to come back to this foundational truth. It's not about what we do, it's not about what we say, it's about who we are in Christ. And we have in the gospels where Jesus calls us friends. I had a conversation with one of my kids this week. They made a very normal mistake that you make when you're kids. Every single one of us in this room, I think has probably made the same mistake. And so we addressed it, we talked it through, it was all good. And then I circled back later and I said, hey, what do you think God is thinking about you right now? And this kid said, I mean, I don't know. I know God knows because God knows everything. And I could see the wheels spinning in their mind. What I wanted was an opportunity to remind this kid, it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter the mistake that you made. God sees you and God loves you. And God says who you are is good. We've dealt with the behavior. Who you are is good. Does it mean there aren't things that I need to adjust so that I am a more loving friend? Does it mean there aren't things that you will need to adjust so that you are a more loving friend? But if we can come back to that core identity and begin to invite God to help us shift that belief, it makes all the difference in our friendships and relationships. The second truth that we need to come back to is Genesis chapter two, verse 18. God says, it is not good for the man to be alone, I'll make him a helper, a companion. Now, if you've grown up in church, especially the evangelical church, you probably have heard this a lot of times and taught in the context of marriage. And that is good and it's correct. It's just not the full picture and the full story. You see, yes, God is talking about marriage here, but he's also talking about marriage as the beginning of community and connection and family and friendships. We have a lot of people in the Bible who had deep friendships who never got married. I have friends in my life who have chosen not to get married or who are currently not married. This verse is for them too. It is not good for us to be alone. We need friends. I have been really blessed 
to be married to my husband Ryan for over 15 years. He's my favorite person, my best friend, but he's not my only friend. In fact, we learned early on that if we put all of the pressure on one another to be everything that we need in a relationship, to be the only one that we have fun with and the only one that we confide in and the only one that offers us support, that that puts a lot of pressure on us as a couple that doesn't work out so well. And so we are really grateful to have a whole community of other couples and friends that we get to be in life together with. So two truths that we start with. You are good. Who you are at your core. The deepest, truest part of you created in the image of God is good. And it's not good to be alone. So what does it look like to begin to, to build these friendships or to take the friendships that we have and to make them healthier or to experience more joy and life from the friendships that we have. Well, what I want us to look at together today is the life and ministry of Jesus. Now, we're not looking at his words, we're not looking at what he says about friendship, but what we see is a pattern that Jesus lived out that I think helps us. And if we follow this pattern, I think, and I know based off of my own experience, and even now some of what psychology and science is teaching us, that this pattern Jesus modeled for us, it works. And it helps us cultivate and build healthy friendships. And so we're gonna start together in Mark chapter one, verse 16 through 20. Passing along the beach of Lake Galilee, he saw Simon, his brother, Andrew, net fishing. Fishing was their regular work, just normal, every day, doing what they do. Jesus says to them, come with me. I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, they dropped their nets, and they followed. So we see this story and lots of other stories very similar to it. They're littered all throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where Jesus is initiating. That's the first ingredient that we're gonna focus on today if we wanna revamp our friendships. It's initiation. Jesus is inviting them to come and do life with him. Come and follow me. Come and be a part of what I'm doing. He's extending an invitation. We see it over and over and over again. Not just to those who became his apostles and his disciples, but to other people like Zacchaeus. How many of you grew up seeing Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? So Zacchaeus in the tree, and then they wound up at his house. I mean, lots of invitations and initiation. We also see moments where Jesus responds to someone else's initiation. Someone else gets Jesus's attention. They interrupt him when he's on his way to go do something important. And he responds. And so some questions that I think we can consider if initiation is an, an ingredient that maybe we want to add into the mix or maybe we need a little bit more of in our world is am I reaching out? Am I initiating with those around me, or am I kind of stuck in this mindset that, you know, friendships just kind of happen? And if you're lucky, you have friends. And am I maybe somebody who's just kind of waiting for someone else to initiate with me? We can't control whether someone else initiates with us, but we can control if we are initiating. Am I reaching out? Am I texting and letting someone know that I'm thinking about them, that I'm praying for them? Am I inviting someone for coffee? Am I asking them to come over for dinner? Am I joining a group? Am I inviting someone else to join a group? Am I planning and inviting and checking in? Instead of waiting for someone else to plan something fun to do, am I planning something fun to do and inviting others to come and join me? Am I showing up? Sometimes, if we're struggling with this core identity thing, we don't feel worthy or valuable or good enough to be in community, sometimes we will be physically present, but we're not actually showing up. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're there, but we're withholding. What would it look like to show up, to be present, to be there physically and mentally and in your heart with the people that you're with, 
It's risky, but it's worth it. And then am I interruptible? Maybe you're someone who has great friendships and community around you. You've got a lot going on. You're like Jesus and you're headed and you're doing all the things. And they're important things. They're life-giving things. Are you interruptible? This is one that I want to work on. I want to have enough margin in my life that someone can interrupt me with a need or a question or a thing and I can stop what I'm doing and respond. That can be difficult for me. Are we willing to make room at our table for someone else who maybe needs a spot in community? And then the last question for this one is, am I responsive? Now, how many of you have looked at your phone recently and realized, oh my goodness, they texted me three days ago, and when I saw it, I couldn't respond, and then I forgot. Okay, I'm glad it's not just me. I mean, we gotta text back. We have to respond. We have to RSVP. We have to be able to say, yes, I'm there, sign me up. Even if I'm kinda tired, even if uh, it's kinda scary and I don't know if I wanna go. Am I being responsive? And then the question that we want to consider before we move on to the second ingredient we're going to talk about today is, is it reciprocal? Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you ever, you know, been initiating a friendship with someone? You've invited them a couple of times. You've reached out. You're texting. And you realize that really that only happens if you're doing the initiating. And then you start to wonder, like, do they want to be my friend? Do they have time for me? I don't know. So we want to pay attention to whether or not it's reciprocal. That is important information for us. But here's what I want you to be careful of. If you're going to tell yourself a story, make sure it's a good story. Because what do we do? This goes back to our foundational truth. When someone's not reciprocating or when Carissa doesn't text you back after three days, you think she doesn't like you. But she does. I do. And I do the same thing. I still have moments when I'll think to myself, ooh, I invited this person or I asked them and I didn't hear back. And I'll think, oh gosh, did I offend them? Did I do something wrong? And I'm like, wait a second, Carissa, you gotta take your own advice. If you're gonna tell yourself a story, make sure it's a good one. I don't know why. And if I'm not willing or able to ask, you know what? Life must just be full for them. Maybe they're struggling right now and this is a moment when I can hold them up in prayer. If you're gonna tell yourself a story, make it a good one. And when you sense that it's reciprocal, there's interest, right? Then you can consider the second ingredient, which is investment. Now here's where we see it in the life of Jesus. Matthew chapter nine. So passing along, Jesus saw a man at his work collecting taxes. His name was Matthew and Jesus said, come along with me. So Matthew stood up and he followed him. So right away, you can see we have initiation and we have a response, but then it goes further. Later, when Jesus was eating supper at Matthew's house with his close followers, a lot of disreputable characters came and joined them. When the Pharisees saw him keeping this kind of company, they had a fit and they let in to Jesus' followers. What kind of example is this from your teacher acting cozy with crooks and misfits? So this investment. Jesus didn't just invite people to come and follow him and then keep them at a safe distance. He had dinner with them. He was in their homes. He celebrated life with them to the point where he was accused of being a drunk who spent way too much time with people that he really shouldn't have been spending time with. He invested in them. He built relationships with them. In Mark chapter 3, we see another moment where this investment is taking place. It says, Jesus climbed a mountain and he invited those he wanted with him. He had a whole group of his followers that he invited to come and be with him. And it says they climbed together. And then he settled on 12 and designated them apostles. So as you're reading through the gospels, you'll begin to see this isn't something that we just notice every once in a while. There is a pattern here that Jesus is living into of initiation and then investment where he's spending time. He's investing in these friendships, in these relationships with people. And so maybe you have some friendships. Maybe you're in a group 
here at Rancho, but you would go, Crystal, we don't really hang out outside of the group. Or I have, there's some people that are kind of in my outer circle and I would really like to get to know them better, but I don't really know how to do that. We invest. So some questions to consider. Am I investing time and energy? Am I making space on my calendar for these friendships? Am I showing up even when I maybe don't necessarily feel like it? Am I there because I've made a commitment to this person or to this group of people? Am I investing my time and my energy? And then are we having fun? Can we have fun together? I mean, we see this in the life of Jesus. It wasn't all about learning and growing and ministering. They had fun together. And so maybe part of this for you would be, can you plan something fun? And do that with some of the people in your circle. Invite them to come and be a part of that with you. And then are we learning and growing and serving together? At the boutique yesterday, I was talking with my friend Anne, and she and her husband lead a group for us here at Rancho. They're fantastic. It's the Tuesday night group, if you're looking for a group. And she was telling me that they have planned with their group, their whole group is going to serve together at the prom next month. There's something incredible about serving with your friends. It builds trust. Um, I, I don't know, I would be even willing to say something a little bit godlike happens when you're with people and you're on mission doing something that matters. And then the question that we ask ourselves before we move on to the third ingredient is have we built trust? Have we built some trust? I don't think trust happens overnight. I don't think wise trust happens overnight. It really does require time and investment of time. It requires kind of testing the water a little bit and making sure that, you know, the person's safe and trustworthy. Yes, they're gonna make some mistakes. Yes, they might say something that offends you every once in a while and hurts your feelings. But overall, are they trustworthy? Because if they are, then we wanna add the third ingredient which is interdependence. And we see this modeled beautifully in the life of Jesus. And remember, if there was anyone who didn't need to be interdependent, it would be Jesus, God in human flesh. One example we see is in Mark chapter six. It says, so they got in the boat and they went off to a remote place by themselves. Some saw them going and the word got around. From the surrounding towns, people went out on foot, running, and they got there ahead of them. They beat the boat. When Jesus arrived, he saw this huge crowd. At the sight of them, his heart broke. Like sheep with no shepherd they were. And he went right to work teaching them. And when his disciples thought this had gone on long enough, it was now quite late in the day, they interrupted. We're a long way out in the country. It's very late, pronounce a benediction and send these folks off so they can get some supper. AKA, Jesus, we're hungry. It's been a long day and we're tired. Can you wrap this up so we can go home? And Jesus said, you do it, fix them supper. I replied, are you serious? How often do you think they said that to Jesus? I think it was a lot. Like, are you serious, Jesus? You want us to go spend a fortune on food for their supper? But he was quite serious. How many loaves of bread do you have? Take an inventory. That did not take long. Five, they said, plus two fish. AKA, we don't even have enough food to feed ourselves. So what do you want us to do? So in this moment, we see interdependence modeled, which is this idea of I need you and you need me and we need one another. I think Jesus could have snapped his fingers and solved the problem. But time and time again, we see him invite others to help meet the need. We see Jesus ask for help. We see Jesus rely on other people, invite them into helping him make things better. We see this again beautifully when Jesus is on the cross. The darkest, most painful, most horrific moment 
in his ministry. It says, while the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. We read that sometimes and we just let it pass. But think about it. Most of Jesus' followers and disciples had scattered. They were terrified for their lives. And I think part of it was they also, I don't think they could bear to see what was about to happen. But these women and John were there to bear witness to his pain, to his experience. They stood in the gap for him. And sometimes that's what we do for one another. We can't solve each other's problems. We can't fix it. We can't make it better. We can't give enough advice to clear up the problem, but we can bear witness to one another's most difficult moments. And then in his most difficult moment, it goes on and it says, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. And he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. And so do you see what we see here is this beautiful interdependence of I need you to bear witness to my pain, to be here, to be present with me. You need me to make sure you are taken care of when I'm no longer physically here. We need one another. And so if you have cultivated some friendships, but maybe you've been surrounded by that shark cage and you're kind of keeping people at a safe distance. Friends, I get it. This is the one that I continue to ask God to help me work on. So some questions for us to consider. Am I risking vulnerability? Am I allowing those that I trust as my friends to see me when I feel kind of messy? To see the parts of me that I'm not proud of? To see me when I'm tired and when I'm needy? Or am I showing up all the time like I kind of have it all together? Am I risking vulnerability? Am I asking for what I need? Am I willing to say, I, I need more time. I need encouragement. I, I, like, my life is struggling. Would you bear witness with me to my pain? Am I asking for what I need? Am I allowing others to care for me as I care for them? Some of us maybe struggle a little bit with, we like to be the one doing all the caring all the fixing, but maybe we struggle a little bit with letting others care for us, accepting care, accepting encouragement, accepting that we have a need. Am I considering the needs of others? And then am I giving grace and forgiveness or am I expecting perfection? Friendship is messy. I had a moment just even a couple of weeks ago where I said something I reacted and it was harsh and I had to circle back and apologize. We all have those moments. I know I've had moments when I have not met someone's important expectation. I've let them down and I've been hurt. But can we continue to show up and offer grace and forgiveness because no friendship is gonna be perfect all the time. Life is a little bit like an open water swim in shark infested waters. Do we have our support team? Do you have people that you can call on to have fun, to learn together, to grow together? People who can bear witness to your most difficult moments. And so there's a picture that will show up on the screen. You're gonna see this cycle played out. It builds, it starts with initiation and then investment and then interdependence. But then guess what? You have to keep going around the circle. You can't get to interdependence and then stop initiating. You can't get there and then stop investing. So this week, what I wanna ask God is that he would maybe show us, each of us individually, and just an area, maybe we need to initiate. We need to reach out, we need to invite, we need to join a group. Maybe we need to make some time to make this a priority in our life. Maybe we need to risk some vulnerability and ask for what we need. I don't know what it is for you. I know what it is for me. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you call us friends. So grateful for that. Thank you that you remind us that our identity is found in you, that you see us and you call us good. Would you help us 
to build meaningful relationships? Can we follow the model that you set forth for us when you lived and moved and breathed among us what we see lived out in the Gospels? Just bring to mind this week just one small way that we might be able to revamp our friendships. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.